there are different things that I will elaborate on during the lecture, but let's say that we will, or I will start with a focus on beauty. Take a few detours through the familiar territory of Hegel's treatment of woman and end with a few speculative theses. So the predicate of the predicate beautiful or beauty has a specific place in Hegel's philosophy. It is generally understood in the terms of aesthetic theory, where beauty is the sensuous appearing of the idea, which means that the freedom is given sensuous expression. However, with regards to woman, there are certain byways present in, in his use of this concept. While there are instances where Hegel recognizes and appreciates, appreciates the character of woman, there is also something inherently inconsistent in such praise. Women are, according to Hegel, of course, worthy of respect, but only as an individual wills, confined to the concreteness of their interior and unlike men, unable to dwell in the universality of spirit. So woman is, for that reason, entangled between the immediate circumstances and remote horizon of a family and stillness of life. But nevertheless, Hegel recognizes beauty in this particular withdrawn conception of her character. Uh, the withdrawal characterizes this beauty that persists in a woman, is attributed to the subject, and is not an expression of the social substance. I think that's one of the uh, speculative theses that we'll get to at the end. By being grounding, grounded in such a withdrawal, women are determined in opposition to the world while at the same time being bound together with it. The question is thus how to reconcile the passivity of wives who are uh, relegated to the private domain with that of tragic figures found in Hegel's corpus, such as uh, Venus, Lucinde, Antigone, Mary Magdalene, and so on and so on. There are quite a few of them. They flee, all of them, they flee from the fate of the, uh, of the spirit and, do, and, do, and in doing so violently determine a fate they produce. The structural role of woman in Hegel's philosophy is clearly displaced in regards to the unfolding of the spirit. However, she is also, as we had heard, I think, uh, during the last uh, two days uh, uh, quite a lot, necessarily for the establishment and preservation of the core a uh, societal principle represented in the family. Specifically, it is the family that enables a woman to be realized as a mother. And only as a woman, let's say woman mother, can a woman be, according to Hegel, in the union with men and together or both through the upbringing of a child. And his sole purpose of the child is to dissolve the family and thereby ensure um, himself independency, which means that she, her, the mother, is fully integrated in the spiritual production of humanity and society. The realization of unity that is in itself by virtue of another or other. Hegel, of course, outlines reasons for such a clear path, which itself does not turn out to be entirely clear as it opens up a number of questions. And we'll get to those probably in the Q&A. Um, the disposition of individual persons for a universal ground and actuating purpose, which is accomplished by uprooting the self-will of the indi individuals and embed, it, and embed their self-consciousness in this unity, unity being the third separate from them, as Hegel puts it in uh, his Vorlesung on, um, on the Richt. This third part in the relationship between sexes toward which the individual strives is uh, Zitlichkeit, or ethical life necessary for their character to come forth. And what is their character? Hegel elaborates it in the following manner, uh, again, in the same lectures. To know the unmovable universal of the free will as their own being. And this principle is so crucial for Hegel, it encompasses everything uh, particular, everything, uh, every interest, it is instance of the right as it is right of the world, meaning that there is no other beyond it. And this is also why Hegel recognizes in the ethical totality or sittliche totality, this is the third party that is holding together the sexual difference. Not an representation of God, but he's saying, uh, again from the same lectures, an actual God. 
So to understand the specific position of woman, as depicted in Hegel, it, is, it seems it is essential to introduce also a religious dimension. That which, is, which spiritualizes, animates everything. Uh, that which is unconditional, free, and an end in itself, as Hegel puts it in his lectures on religion. Engaging in this purpose produces a feeling and findung of pleasure, of genus, from the same lectures of religion, which we call, or Hegel calls, or I think it's the same, we, Hegel, call bliss. <laughs> if we follow the disclosure of the spirit through, the, through ethical life, or zitlichkeit, striving, willing, and doing towards, for the self-consciousness of the universal, this clearly rational activity turns out to have sort, a sort of religious connotations or determination through feelings. Feelings are essential here. And what does it mean to say I have a feeling? Hegel's quite straightforward answer is that, quoting Hegel now, again from the lectures of philosophy for religion, feeling is nothing else but the fact that the content content is my own, and indeed it is my own as this particular individual. And in this manner, I feel not only this otherness in me, but also myself as this otherness. And unlike, unlike thoughts, content or object or any other effect is never present alone before us, but always, again quoting Hegel, in its connection with ourselves and thereby we take pleasure in ourselves. Again, genus. A feeling validates both the thing we feel and ourselves as the feeling subject. And we will return shortly to this religious frame of reference of feeling. The other religious determination can be found in the actualization of the spirit. The spirit of a people considered in its universality is not just an abstract thought, but actually the god of people, as Key Hegel puts it again in the same lectures. <laughs> This is where religion or church and the state intersect and produce a kind of division of labor regarding the actualization of spirit. So both have some work to do, and which is in itself reflected in sexual difference. On the one hand, religion, the spirit uh, is imagined, sensed, and felt. While on the other, opposed to it, of course, the ethical spirit is actual, that which is. This shifts, shifts already, are already quite familiar, familiar and result in the privileging of philosophy, which recognizes the identity of both, whereas religion consumes this knowledge in a limited representational or imaginary form. Uh, and if roughly speaking, we assume that laws are derived from the will of God, then we need to explicate their rationality, which is, again, quoting Hegel from uh, the same lectures of religion, a matter of formation and a particular, a matter of philosophy. Uh, we have a relationship where the two positions are both identical and different. They relate to a common idea of freedom, however, uh, the determinate form in which freedom is depicted is also what distinguishes them. Laws as the unfolding of freedom may take a different form depending on the principle. If the principle is uh, sanctity, which expresses the abstraction of the spirit, then ethical life is relegated to substantial act actuality that is renounced in favor of what is higher. For instance, Marriage as the first ethics that espouses love as duty is opposed by the sacredness of this vow of non-marriage, as Hegel puts it again in the same lectures. I do not think it is far from the truth to say that modernity is predicated on such sacred gesture. The reason for such a drastic distinction is therefore due to the religious inwardness. Which inserts, into, which inserts into every external action the appearance of necessity. Secular duty to achieve independence through reason and activity, which ultimately also applies to economy, industry, and so on. This fear of the actualization of the rational universal will and the absolute justice of freedom is called into question for it is required of men that, insofar as 
his possession, he should not only multiply, I'm quoting Hegel here, he should not only multiply it by his activity, but should also give it away to the poor, and especially, again, Hegel to the church. Hegel thus surprisingly recognizes in the religious piety, where freedom can be freely called into question and even supplanted by obedience, the outlines of modernity. Piety, of course, is the, as Hegel puts it, uh, the feeling and the movement of the ethical life in the feeling, the feeling again. This structural tension does not constitute, constitute a state of exception, but a duplication of the system of justice, one grounded in the legal form and positively of, uh, positivity of laws, while the other, the bedrock of religion, which is based on attitude, on inwardness, actualized through formation and edu education for ethical life. Now, this differentiation is especially important when examining the specific position of women, of course. In Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of right, he highlights the manner in which a woman and a man are instilled in the universality of ethical life. And not surprisingly, the Hegel system their path is not set as individuals who are sub subordinated to the randomness of passion and volition, but as a sort of limbs of a unity. Because according to Hegel, marriage namely constitutes an essential relationship in which bond becomes duty. And in that regard, marriage is a religious category uh, whose binding capacity manifested as a commonality of uh, family goods or domain is reflected in sexual difference. The woman as a wife, as the head of the family life, and as such likened to Vesta. Vesta is the Roman virgin goddess of home, heart, and family. Hurt, hurt, sorry, and family, who is practically never depicted in a human form. And Hegel recognizes in this feature when he describes woman as a wife as the priestess of Vesta. More commonly known, uh, the priestesses are more commonly known as the cult of Westo virgins. The holiness of their priesthood was directly related to their virginity and purity. Despite the appearance of a, of a separate status of woman priestess, priestesses in regards to wives of ethical life, there are clear signs, nevertheless, there are clear signs that their symbolic status overlap. However, more important to the topic at hand is the insight that virginhood was associated with certain privileges with this uh, um, Westas. Um, for instance, freedom. Exclusive for men, which is usually was exclusive for men. Right of giving evidence in court or entrusting their personal property, which wasn't self-evident in ancient Rome. The crucial aspect of this analogy introduced by Hegel is that the matrons have to be formally distinguished from women, but not on an equal footing with men, because they serve universality through the upbringing of their children. This, respect, uh, this perspective of a woman as mother is, of course, a male structural perspective, which, also exclusively, which is also an exclusively universal perspective. However, this means that the woman mother is not exhaustively, exhaustively included in the universality since she self-sacrifices herself for a child who is embedded in natural immediacy. I think that one of the most concrete or most um, filmic depictions of such a motherly love and devotion was the, uh, depicted in the South Korean movie, I hope you watched it, Madeo or Mother. Uh, directed by Boom Hyun Hu. It just, I hope you watch it. The mother goes to the great ranks to prove her son's innocence and is motivated by her maternal bond, but while doing everything possible to disprove her implications in the murder of a younger, her actions, her actions increasingly show the primacy of perception over reality. So she goes completely into uh, her motherly role. Okay, in this sense, we can say that she, the mother, persists as a non-universal within the universal, devoting herself entirely and exclusively to her own particular offspring. For reason to flourish a specific relationship of negative, negative determination, as Hegel puts it, is required whereby the child is wrestled from the natural immediacy. 
the universal is maintained with such a specific space for negativity, similarly as civil society, the existence of which constitutes, again, Hegel quotes, I quote in Hegel, the loss of ethical life, is also preconditioned for ethical life. The substantial life of the mother in Hegel's uh, theory is bound to the particularities of the child, the inner life and more generally family. M meanwhile, on the other hand, of course, man, husband, is outwardly intervening in the universal. The husband father has his, quoting Hegel, his actual substantial life in the state, in the struggle and work with the external world and himself. And in doing so, the man appears as an external world which he appropriates. In essence, he thereby, quoting Hegel again, makes himself his very own, um, he makes himself his very own and determines himself and gains his free personhood. In this way, the husband is able to carve out an independent oneness with himself, but only by, by being separated from oneself. So in the context of the family, a man is thus not this or that man, uh, this or that husband, but the universal category of man. Meanwhile, we said that woman doesn't have that privilege. A wife mother, on the other hand, of course, is disengaged from such active participation and is relegated to the substantial determination, the concrete interior of a family and her ethical disposition. A semblance of universality is for her possible only through such disengagement, so completely different. Moreover, it seems that the only means, object, uh, means of objectivity and actualization for a woman is woven through the feeling of love. And love, of course, uh, in family. And while family is the world fulfilled and only through its spiritually born, it is love that exhibits the most terrible contradiction, uh, Hegel puts it in uh, his lectures. And I hope uh, Bojana will have time to go more into love. I think I don't have so much time to go in another, into another topic. I'll maybe just highlight just a few characteristics that are maybe relevant to the topic at hand. In general, just in general, love is consciousness of my unity with others so that we get our being for ourselves through letting go of the latter and the other person achieves the same effect through us. So a contradiction of the Punctuality, as Hegel puts it, punctuality of self-consciousness that, un that understanding cannot resolve. So it is, a be being a, it is a matter of emotion or feeling, and love has no place in the state or universality of reason. But this separation also explains, I would say, explains such phenomena as uh, still not so relevant that, as it was uh, 100 years ago, but still relevant uh, enough uh, neo-confederate Neo Confederate Female Association United Daughters of Confederacy, which is, I don't know if you know, which is uh, to this day engaged in the commemoration of Confederate so, uh, civil soldiers and is based on the Confederate lost cause ideology, which means Southern way of life. And this particular outlook asserted woman's cultural authority over virtually every representation of uh, the region's past. Everything from history, from uh, history curriculum to lobbying state or archives to include specific lit literature and exclusive state rights were vital to preserve and promote private interests against the state. So this is still going on and it's still strong, but uh, it was, uh, I think, more important a couple of decades ago. We already mentioned that a woman through the family represent the ethical virtue of Asian Roman pietas, piety, duty, and religiosity. These widows, daughters, that I was talking about, United Daughters of Confederacy, radically, I would say, encompass the woman character based solely on the fulfillment of religious obligations and respect for the parents, homeland, and the elders who represent the dead ancestors, of course. Although their work expresses universal characteristics doing the Antiguan work of remembering and burying the dead. It is done by accident or of particular inclinations and opinions and is therefore embedded in the indeterminate unity of feeling without authentic articulation of gemut, without the self-determination quality of reason. And this, this inherent gap in the universality means that man never relates to woman as a universal, but rather 
uh, then speculate on how this negative non-relationship determines a man. We will focus on a specific uh, feminine uh, quality, the maize kern, not exclusively of wife, mother. As already mentioned, there is a fundamental difference between the mother and a woman as such, who is inscribed in the spirit in a non-relational way. In contrast to men, who, is, who forms a constellation around reason, objectivity, politics, spirit, and so on, and is internally divided by contradiction, uh, that of course he is able to overcome, uh, woman as such is embedded in feeling, enthusiasm, passivity, and subjectivity. For this reason, knowing and willing that are in integral to the spiritual folding of self consciousness appear in woman as feeling and intuition. There are, of course, today I think uh, it has been already pointed out that there are also different perspectives on the figure of Antigone, the absolute example of tragedy. Ethical life is not family life but as manifested primarily as the law of woman, the law of sensual subjectivity, sub subjective substantiality, of in interiority, which unlike the law of the state, has yet to reach its full realization. The implications have been, I think, discussed elsewhere. However, it is not a question of opening up a space for a third law due to the tension between them, nor of being uh, there uh, being a position between the two, but of recognizing the internal deadlock of the law itself. Even if Antigone is not an exclusive example for Hegel's understanding of woman as such, she embodies a clear distinction to the state of law in which she sees only the, quoting Hegel, uh, she sees only the violence of human cap caprice. Relationship between woman and man is superseded by the relationship between sister and brother, a relationship of the same blood that is based on rest and equi equilibrium, as Hegel puts it in the phenomenology. They are ethically the same, which enables them to realize themselves in and through their siblings without the need to refer to another, to a child, as we mentioned before. However, it is only the sister that is intrinsically bound to the law of the family. She is not able to leave the, the family as such, merely move to another one in another ma in marriage. As Hegel puts it, family is an implicit inner essence which is not exposed to the daylight of consciousness. Rather, rather it remains inner feeling and the divine displaced from actuality. And this tragic circumstance, this tragic in the Hegelian sense uh, for whom it is it en ensues when an individual part negates an universal has at least two consequences that are of interest to us. Firstly, such a position in the family means that the woman don't get verified in thinking, as Hegel puts it somewhere. Uh, since thinking in Hegel's hands means to discover that and how things that are at hand are at the same time the realization of uh, or being there of an imminent necessity. Antigone embodies this inability to participate in thinking and her exclusion from experience of the domain of the state. But it is precisely this exclusion that makes her able to step into the playing field of the universal and become a particular self. Usually, such concretization in Hegel is limited to the Christian world of modernity. Okay, this is the first consequence. The second one, by burying her brother, Antigone commits a violent act against the law of the state, even though she withdrew from the private sphere of the family and followed them to the bitter end. The impossible forced choice between the laws drove Antigone to commit the crime against one of them, but also, uh, also brought forth a sense of guilt in her. To prevent the universality of the state law in favor of satisfying primary family, family end means for Hegel to have, quoting Hegel again, to feel the power of their lord and master, death. This tragic recognition, born of the uh, withdrawal of be the beautiful soul, is that to act as always to, a to act means that to is always to act violently. The violence exhibited here is a violence of feelings, which is why Antigone withdraws, but in doing so, withdraws a part of universality also. 
And this gesture, this gesture of withdrawal, uh, meaning in German zurückziehen or uh, herausstritten from the world, is most prominently highlighted by Hegel in uh, one of his early uh, Jena uh, essays, The Spirit of Christianity and Its Faith. And in that essay, the gesture is depicted through the figure of Jesus as an excessive act of distancing and passivity, which, as a byproduct, that produces an action that undermines the law of the state and, more generally speaking, manifests the fate of the world. I think that uh, this specific feature brings together Antigone and Jesus, but our aim was to unveil the nucleus of womanhood, of course, so it seems uncommon to include Jesus in this discussion. But there is, there is a point, there is a quality to Jesus uh, in this regard that will, I think, interest us. Uh, Jesus, who, according to Hegel, articulates Zitli Heights and stands in contrast to Kant's morality, is namely the principal figure through which Hegel portrayed the beautiful soul. The beautiful soul, which has become, of course, the figure of everything in human nature that needs to be ridiculed, is initially it was a figure embodied, which embodied the rise of reason in regards to ethics. But it very quickly became obvious that it was necessary to include the dimension of sensuality or to ensure, ensure the homeless of the spirit. However, as the beautiful soul withdrew, withdraws from the fields of activity, of positive law, the pure moral essence is superseded by the purity of its heart or, as Hegel puts it in his uh, essay, The Spirit of Christianity and Its Faith, he says that, oh, the grievous necessity of such violations of the holy, the deepest, holiest sorrow of a beautiful soul, soul its most incomprehensible riddle is that its nature has to be dis uh, disrupted, its holiness solid. So the beautiful soul, as introduced in the phenology of spirit, I think radicalizes this position, as it, quoting Hegel from the phonology, lives in dread of tainting the splendor of its inner being by action and an existence. And in order to persevere the purity of its heart, it flees from contact with the actual world. In this transparent purity of moments, it lights, its light dies away with it, and it vanishes like a shapeless vapor that dissolves into thin air. The beautiful soul in this uh, depiction presents an unusual link between the afterlife and this world that it is factually, I would say, a dead end. It is self-contained and autonomous soul that exists in the spiritless, unreconciled immediacy, and it remains enclosed in its concept, averse to any action, withdrawn from the world. In her conscience and in her environing ethical society, she has all the needs for the moral management of her life. So, in, in, so probably that's one of the questions that is supposed to be asked here is, a woman in the last distance, a beautiful soul. And I think that this can be answered by referring to the gesture of withdrawal that Hegel in that face in Jesus. We can even say that the defining gesture of Jesus and the spirit that inaugurates as it gives rise to subjectivity. Quoting Hegel from the Yena Lectures, against purely, purely objective commands, Jesus said something totally foreign to them, namely the subjective in general. And this excess of subjectivity, I would say, sidesteps the barrenness of formal laws as it strives to, for fulfillment. To unify, quoting Hegel from the Yena Lectures, to unify the discords necessitated by our development. And this is also the proper aim of religious practice, which is for Hegel, quoting Hegel from the same lectures, the most holy, the most beautiful of all things, the spirit of beauty by lacing in religious action. They are the emptiest of all. There is thus, according to Hegel, beauty in withdrawal and here it is related to the subject rather than the substance. Withdrawal from every engagement with the spirit of right, the law of the state here expresses fulfillment, even though the gesture of withdrawal comes close to the demands of ethical life, it is actually a lot more radical. As the beautiful soul does not stop before the law, it insists on this 
conscious decision, even when it comes to relationship with family and friends. The beautiful soul is reconciled with uh, its fate. It relinquishes all relations, which is an abstraction from himself, but has no fixed boundaries. And Hegel is clear that this fate is uh, uh, individual's own product, and not, quoting Hegel, not the pure passivity, the overwhelming power of a foreign thing. To avoid ending up under an external foreign force, the individual goes so far as to renounce its life and, quoting Hegel, withdraws into the void altogether. And this absolute passivity, the plight of the soul, not of the owl, the soul, pure feeling of inwardness produces an activity that is of a different mode than the laws of the state. And Hegel, Hegel again in the uh, Yina lectures, passionately declares, quoting him, Life has been unfaithful to him, but he has been not unfaithful, unfaithful to life. The highest freedom is the negative attribute of the beauty of the soul. That is, the possibility of renouncing everything in order to preserve oneself. So, going to the end. But whoever wants to save his life will lose it. So, not life, but beauty. As was the case in the in, in ancient Greek world, Hegel recognizes in his own time the beauty that beauty can be preserved by facing one, one's own fate. And we can say that beauty as the non-totalizable part of law. While Hegel probably ruminated about the fate of Christianity in the wake of the wake, a couple of decades of the collapse of ancient Greek life, our aim is, however, to show how to reconcile this reading with the position of woman. And this is the speculative part, the speculative thesis. While the interpretation of Hegel's thoughts are mostly focused on Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Hölderlin, I think that Schiller, Goethe, and Schlegel, who had an immense effect on Hegel, will be more useful in this regard. For instance, it was Schiller's On Grace and Dignity, an essay on beauty and beautiful soul, that Hegel, in his lectures on aesthetics, recognized as the, uh, the profound speculative value of the work uh, in, quoting Hegel, the fact that he makes the praise of woman, in particular, his object. This praise is based on the fact that woman embodied the aesthetical ideal of union of nature and spirit, and that they express in the fullest way the dignity which exemplifies a beautiful soul. Of course, the parallels can be criticized. I hope they are criticized, but which is why we can also point to another one, another example. It's Friedrich Schlegel, uh, Schlegel and his um, uh, Lucinde, where Lucinde and uh, Julia, Julius embrace one another with, quoting uh, Schlegel, sensu sensuous passivity or sens sensuous abandon, hingebung. A passivity, they, that, uh, passivity they seem to cultivate actively, worshiping uh, Hyacinth and scorning Prometheus. And Hegel, in the philosophy of right, underlines this work in relation to sens sensuous abandon, where he explicitly argues that the girl surrenders her honor in sensuous abandon which is not the case with men, of course, who has yet another field for his ethical activity in the family. Um, I think that we won't go further with the explication at this point. I just maybe a third speculative thesis that the argument for woman as uh, beautiful souls can be taken from Hegel's definition of woman. Uh, their natural passivity is woven together uh, with a certain aspects of relationship to God by means of the imagination, as he puts it in, uh, in the Yenai lectures, yeah. whereby they express, we can say not identical, but some features of the beautiful soul. And as beautiful soul, just one quote, how beautiful soul was supposed to look like in the phenomenology, the beautiful soul knows the inner voice of its immediate knowledge as a divine voice in the majesty of its sublimity over the determinate law and every content of duty. I won't go further because it just gets more speculative, so thank you very much for listening and I hope for some questions.